Hello again, everybody. Mr. Krauser here. Still talking about the U.S.-Mexican War. Now, last class and last video, we discussed it as an overview. In class, we did a lot more in, in discussions and uh, a little bit more in depth because of the, where the discussions brought us. But in the video, I gave a brief overview of the causes of the Mexican-American War, um, the different key terms that you would need to know. But today, we're going to go a little bit more in depth. Um, we're going to talk about the rise of slavery, uh, not necessarily the rise of slavery, but more so the rise of the slavery issue uh, coming up in regards to the Mexican-American War and the increasing sectionalism in America. Now, those are two very big deals in American history, slavery and sectionalism. All right, and sometimes they're interconnected. Sectionalism, because you guys already know what slavery is, we don't have to deal with that. Sectionalism is quite simply just the competing interests of the different regions of America. These different regions, most notably North and South, have different interests. The North is uh, interested in manufacturing and in urbanization, whereas the South is interested in slavery and agriculture. And they often localize their interests and make that the prime importance of the country. They don't really see the big picture, in other words. So sectionalism is really just the breaking up of uh, a nation like America into different sections. And so all these sections then end up competing against one another, and they don't look at the bigger picture. They don't look at the unifying picture. They don't try to compromise, for the most part. And this is ultimately what's going to spur us towards the Civil War. And that's one of the reasons why the United States-Mexican War could be considered a turning point in American history, uh, thrusting us forward to the Civil War because of all the sectionalism happening at this time because not everybody was on board with going to war and not everybody was on board with necessarily adding these new places like California and Texas and the southwest region that we took from Mexico because they didn't know how to divvy it up between free states and slave states. The North didn't really want them entered in as slave states and the slave states didn't really want them entered in as free states because it changes the power of the government it changes who's going to end up electing a president it changes the whole dynamic of the country so let's get into it we're not going to deal with the 12 years of slave scene but uh, it is a very graphic movie but it is a uh, pretty good movie um, in terms of slavery but it is quite graphic so I can't really recommend it to you guys do now you can go back on your own term now a recap in some key terms Manifest destiny is a huge key term. We've discussed it at length for weeks now. It's this underlying factor that kind of pushes us through everything. And quite simply, it's the undeniable fate to spread over the entire continent. In addition, you need to know that Texas is annexed, and annexed means joined or added to the Union, to America. And Texas seems to want this because they're predominantly filled with white settlers from America. The Southerners are going to support it because they're going to want Texas to be a slave state, but the Northerners are going to generally oppose it, and Mexico outright hates that the United States annexed Texas because they never recognized that Texas was independent and could choose to be annexed to the Union. So they're going to see this as theft on the part of America, America stealing land that is rightfully theirs. In addition, we talked about in the last video and last class that there is a dispute over the boundary of Mexico. The United States is going to claim the boundary is the Rio Grande River, whereas Mexico is going to claim it's the Nueces River. So the Nueces River is up further towards the north, the northern end of Texas. So that would give Mexico more of Texas and more of the land. Whereas the Rio Grande is further down south, so that would give America more of the land. And remember, we discussed that it's really this boundary issue that starts the war. Because President Polk is going to send troops down into the disputed area between the Nueces and Rio Grande. And Mexico is going to say, get out and leave. And the troops aren't going to do that, the American troops. So then Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the president of Mexico at this time, is going to then order his troops to go 
and fight the American troops. And they do, and they kill some of them. So then President Polk essentially has what he needs to declare war because he's going to spin it. Um, some may argue it's a spin, some don't, and it's really up to you to decide. But he's going to use that situation of American soldiers dying, of saying that Mexico invaded our land, and so now we must attack. Now, the war is eventually going to end. And we're done with the Mexican-American War, but it's going to have an after effect. But you need to know that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is the treaty that ended the Mexican-American War. And as part of this treaty, Mexico is going to give up claim to Texas and sets the Rio Grande River as the southern border. So essentially they say, America, you get your way. You'll get Texas, and the Rio Grande River is now the southern border between Texas and Mexico. In addition... Mexico is actually going to give New Mexico and California to the United States. And in return, I don't know if the United States was just trying to play nice by giving them some money, or they felt bad, or whatever, or they wanted to insult them more. The United States is going to give Mexico $15 million, even though they won the war. Now, last time we discussed how President Polk sends a guy named Slidell to California to negotiate purchasing California and also paying for, really, Texas, even though we weren't offering much. We are going to offer about $5 million for Texas and approximately $30 million for California. So notice that this is a very different figure. And some people would say that it's still generous because we won the war. Why are we paying them? Other people are saying, well, that's just adding insult to injury of just giving money, like pity money, to Mexico after taking a bunch of their lands. So that's important to note. But then just a few years after this, Mexico is going to sell even more land, although comparatively much smaller, during the Gadsden Purchase of 1853. And this is where Mexico is going to sell about 30,000 square miles to the United States for $10 million. And it's really just a part of New Mexico and Arizona. So that's a little bit more of a fair price, people would say, especially comparatively, because this is a much smaller area than California, New Mexico, and Texas, which we got for $15 million because we went to war and we won, as opposed to this $10 million for the Gadsden Purchase. Now this is going to show you a map and this is a this is an excellent map showing all the places that America since its founding and since the colonies really started gathering up. Now this brown over here towards the right, this is the original territory of the 13 colonies or 13 states, but it's essentially going to be ceded, which means gives up, surrendered by Great Britain by 1783 and so we have all these lands in 1783 but then notice we gain more than half of what our nation actually is after that right it started out just this right half but then we're slowly and surely going to start adding other stuff we add um florida we're going to add west florida and east florida this is traditionally the florida that we know the one that comes down that's going to be ceded by the spanish in 1819 um we're going to add Texas, obviously. Uh, this is what we're talking about, the Texas annexation around 1845. It was formerly the Republic of Texas, which is why it's considered the Lone Star State. Um, the Gadsden Purchase, which we just mentioned right here, that's this little piece of land. All right. Now, this pink all here is essentially what was given up uh, after the war, uh, the Mexican-American War, because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And again, we paid for some of it. But really, it was more pity money. We did um, get all of this land, and then we also got Texas, although some may argue that we already had Texas at that point, and we went to war because of it. And then this becomes Mexico. So we took uh, a little bit more than half of Mexico's land, and we added all of this um, around 1850, a little bit before. And then obviously a few years just before that, we also added Oregon. So we had all this already, this upper left-hand corner, but then we're going to add all this from Mexico. So big, big, big things happening in America. Cause again, this idea of manifest destiny is kind of coming to fruition. It's kind of coming true because we start out here, one C, and as the song says, from sea to shining sea. Well, we only had the Atlantic Ocean, 
But now we're going to have the Pacific Ocean, and that's why this, California, was so important because of the harbors that could be there uh, as well. And then we're going to get the Gadsden Purchase, even though it's small, still trying to fill in some holes there. Um, now, this middle part was shortly after the American Revolution and Britain ceding all of this right-hand corner to America and recognizing our independence. This, in 1803, was the Louisiana Purchase, and I'm not going to talk about that because we've dealt with that before. Um but notice we're essentially getting big chunks of land every handful of years. So very, very important. Now, problems are going to arise, as they always do in history, especially. Now, the slave states, the ones that already had slavery in there, predominantly what we know as the South, they wanted these new territories, which we just showed you. They wanted all these territories to be slave states as well. But because of sectionalism, the northern free states did not want this. So essentially, these states up here did not want slavery over here. But these states wanted slavery over there because, again, the balance of power. And so there's going to be a bunch of different, not necessarily treaties, but a bunch of different compromises that come up, a bunch of different ideas of solving this problem. And... One that came up that's somewhat important, even though it doesn't happen, is the Wilmot Proviso. And this essentially said that no slavery is allowed in territories from Mexico. So that would mean slavery is not allowed in California, Nevada, uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, or Texas, uh, and then some of the other lands too, like New Mexico. Um, that's what it said, but this is never going to become a law, but it does spark a lot of controversy because this sectionalism is actually going to be boiling over now. It's going to become a big issue because people are going to start bringing it up, saying that's an unfair plan, and then they're going to start throwing out their own plans left and right. So that's really what sparks it. So even though the Wilmot Proviso does not come to pass, it does not become a law, it does spark the conversation which is important. Now, how are they actually going to decide what states become free states and what states become slave states? Well, that is a huge, huge issue. Now, one idea, which is also a key term, is popular sovereignty. Now, essentially, that idea says a territory should be able to decide for themselves what they want. The people who are going to be living there should decide by vote. And Stephen A. Douglas is the guy who really espouses this idea, who puts it on the table. Popular sovereignty. Let the people decide who are living there. Now, another plan, which was from John C. Calhoun, was to extend the Missouri Compr Compromise Line to the Pacific, which would essentially do the same thing that the Missouri Compromise did initially and separate the South and the North, the free states and the slave states. So uh, r really that idea is not going to come to pass too much. It's going to be a mishmash of all of these. But again, this all started because the Wilmot Proviso, that gets rejected and then people are like, well, let's just have people vote. And then, well, well, let's not have people vote because that could get messy. Let's instead extend the Missouri Compromise. Now, during this time, you're going to have an election, the election of 1848. And essentially, everyone's going to try to ignore the slavery question. The Democrats are going to elect a guy named Lewis Cass, which you guys don't know who he is. And that should kind of give you a hint that we're not going to talk much about him because he doesn't become president. And the Whigs party is going to nominate Zachary Taylor, but a new party is going to emerge during this time. The Free Soil Party. Big, important party. Key term. And this is the anti-slavery party, uh, and it forms in 1848, and they focus on the dangers of extending slavery, not the immorality of slavery. They just don't want the balance of power shifted. They're not arguing that slavery is immoral and thus should be abolished. They're saying the new states should not be entered in as slave states. They're fine with slavery where it is. They just don't want it extended. And they're going to nominate Martin Van Buren. And this all is going to lead to the Compromise of 1850. And Zachary Taylor is going to win the election. But in 1850, he has to figure out the slavery mess. And he's going to start doing that. 
All right. Now, this is what this Compromise of 1850 does, ultimately, and it breaks it down. You guys can take a look at this. I'm not going to go over everything, but ultimately, California is going to be admitted as a free state. There's going to be popular sovereignty in U Utah and New Mexico. The Texas borders dispute is going to be solved, um, and the slave trade is going to be abolished in the District of Columbia.